Hello, and welcome to Piano Tech Radio Hour, the weekly bridge to the future of the Piano Tech community. I'm David Anderson. And I'm Ethan Janney. And we're here to ask great questions, and then we'll shut up and listen to some of the authorities, experts, and most outstanding personalities in our little world of pianos. So, put on your best set of headphones, and let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome yet again to Piano Tech Radio Hour. Looking forward to another fun day today. Hope you guys are all having a good Saturday. Excited to hear, you know, been hearing from a lot of community members that, you know, business has been picking up. I know we're still dealing with, you know, COVID issues and people are in and out of the house and under various degrees of uh, restrictions, but um, it seems like people are getting out there, getting out and about, getting back to business, uh, getting some work done. Uh, so very excited to hear about that. Um, and yet yeah, still here to support folks who are uh, looking to get things rolling again uh, in greater detail. I'll give a quick shout out to people watching on social so they know what we're, what they're checking out. Um, and then we'll get rolling for the day today. Uh, today, I just want to give a little bit um, of a wrap up on, on some things. But uh, like I said, I'll give an intro to the session and, uh, and then we'll get rolling. So welcome uh, to those of you that are viewing here to Piano Tech Radio Hour. And this is a session where we bring you, you know, some of the best in the piano industry, whether that be technicians or, you know, students brand ambassadors or uh, store owners or, or even sometimes players and things like this and we learn from them and and everybody here you know if you're here often if you're watching if you're participating and, and even our instructors right it's pretty clear that the folks that are involved are at the at the top of their game or looking to be at the top of the game in the piano tech world and so really appreciate everyone that's here and appreciate the fact that we can all bond all throughout the world to this end. Um, this event is brought to us by Piano Technicians Masterclasses, which is an associated project that's been around since 2017. We bring uh, cutting edge instruction from piano industry masters without leaving your home. People can find more out about that at pianotechniciansmasterclass.com. And um, as I've been saying recently, Piano Technicians Masterclasses, we have some subscription models and we've been adapting those throughout the pandemic and updating how exactly those subscriptions get executed. Previously, what people would do uh, when we started out with, with the masterclasses was they would subscribe for a year and then they'd be eligible for, you know, we would usually do about six or seven master classes throughout the year. And throughout the pandemic, uh, we've discovered the power of conventions. We can sort of do one event that brings everyone together in a more meaningful way. And so, you know, at this moment in time, you can, in addition to attending a convention and sort of signing up for access to recordings as part of that, which is generally our kind of high high tier package, um, you could also be a subscriber to Piano Technicians Masterclasses on a monthly basis, and those same lectures, you'll have access to them, but it'll, it'll be um, in a in sort of a graded schedule of releases. And so this month, we're releasing to that library of lectures, a lecture from David Stanwood from December 2020, um, which was all about kind of piano, touch, and tone. A uh, really interesting lecture where, you know, uh, probably the most uh, interesting thing that I uh, took out of it was a really strong focus on wool and its role in the sound of the piano, how uh, the properties of wool are so unique and special for the creation of piano hammers and the tone that we want to get out of them. And, uh, and in addition, kind of you know, how do we voice? How do we think about the hammer in terms of the, the components of the hammer and like the different areas of the hammer, um, you know, the, the, the strike point, uh, the shoulders, um, the different layers of felt and how they affect 
the type of sound we want to get out of the hammer. So a very intriguing lecture. Um, and that if you're a subscriber, that should be in your library, should have just uh, appeared yesterday on the 1st of October. Um, so excited to hear your feedback on that. If you go watch that lecture or rewatch that lecture, I uh, hope you enjoy it. Um, another thing that's really interesting about David Stanwood, if you're not aware, he knows a lot about sheep and wool because he actually has some sheep on his property. Um, during the lecture, I would take a quick peek out his window into his yard and he has a handful of sheep that hang out there. And in addition to that, his wife is actually a felt specialist. She makes art uh, with felt and she does a lot of really cool stuff with felt. So um, he's exactly the person you wanna hear about felt and wool from. Um, also from that convention, we had another interesting lecture that <clears throat> addressed the importance of wool in pianos, but that one uh, was from Alex Kirstan, uh, out of Steingraber Pianos in uh, in Germany. And uh, he also discussed at great length um, how they think about creating hammers and the importance of the wool that they use and how they process the wool and, and special instructions they, that they give to hammer makers. Um, they actually at Steingraber make special requests of the hammer makers so that they get exactly the type of uh, that the wool gets treated exactly how they'd like it to be treated in order to create the sound um, that they appreciate the most. Um, so that's really, really cool stuff. And, and um, this is a, a little bit of kind of piano industry news. Um, uh, Alex Kirstan, who did host that lecture, he was working for Steingraber Pianos at the time, and he actually has changed positions. I believe he is at Bosendorfer now. Um, don't quote me on that, but he has moved to a different organization. Um, as far as I know, with with the uh, the good the taking the goodwill of the Sion uh, Graber uh, group along with him, um, just kind of moving on to to different things um, that he's doing there. So that's exciting, and hopefully we'll get him back involved involved with um, with that brand as well. So um, I want to give a little bit of the a recap on the the convention today. I uh, want to answer questions for people um, about the future. Also would like to take a minute to kind of reflect on the entire history of Piano Technician's master classes from its origins all the way to what it is today. Because I think, you know, all, various of you have entered the journey at various points in time. And I think it's interesting to um, really get a picture of everything that's been going on and how it's evolved. So, uh, and if you have any questions that come up along the way, you know, feel free to um, put them in the chat. Um, if anybody's got anything they, they feel would be interesting to share, you can go ahead. Um, I see we got a handful of people watching online on Facebook and YouTube. Um, you're welcome to write, uh, write things in the chat as well. I see Rennie, uh, I wish I could pronounce this, N-G-U-Y-E-N. -E I see you out there uh, watching us on Facebook, um, welcome. And um, we will uh, post a link in the Facebook chat. Um, if you wanna join us in the Zoom today, I will post a link so that you can do that. Um, and typically, if you haven't joined us before, you can register um, each week and join us for free, or you can sign up for Piano Tech Radio, our subscription, in which case you'll automatically be able to attend all of, the, all of these sessions without going through any particular uh, extra steps each week. And on top of that, you'll have recordings in the member area. So that's pretty cool. Um, as far as the convention goes, uh, I'm gonna get to that in a minute, give a little bit of a recap. And I'm just gonna pull up some notes here first. Um, but, but yeah, I just wanna bring you all back. And I'm curious as I, talk through the story, how much you all know about this story. So this is a story of piano technicians, master classes, how we got started and how we got to, to where we are today. Um, and if you have any questions or comments along the way, I very much appreciate your participation. So back in, I think it was 2017, the year 2017, this was when I was actually doing some pretty hardcore research in the piano industry. Um, I have been a piano technician 
since you know around the year 2000 when I learned how to tune pianos while I was at the university um, at Rutgers studying jazz piano performance you know and ever since then I had been tuning pianos as as a way to uh, earn some income and you know do something musical that could be professional as well I also started a apprenticeship program in New York City um, to teach other people how to become piano technicians that tended to be you know, local people to Brooklyn, uh, where I was living, typically younger people in their 20s um, who, you know, were, were musical and, you know, thought it would be a great way to make some extra money and do something they could be passionate about. And we, we bring people on who are, you know, just curious about pianos and tuning. Um, and you can look that business up if you want. It's floatingpianofactory.com. Um, and enjoyed working on that business over the years. That business is actually written up in the Wall Street Journal at, at a point in time. Uh, we had a reporter from the journal actually use our services and report on what we were doing. Um, one of the cool features of what we do at Floating Piano Factory is we bring on people who are younger or new to the business, and we offer their services at a discounted rate um, to our clients in exchange for the client having a little bit of tolerance that they're in their learning phases right so they're going to get a pretty good tuning done um but you know they're they are they're actually in the learning process it might take a little bit longer um, they might run into an issue that they don't know how to handle and someone else from our team can come back and pick up the reins at that point um, and of course i started that because i was always frustrated as someone trying to learn about pianos and being a piano technician you know, if I was if I was alone and I was independent and I ran into a problem, what, what do they do? You know, there are a lot of other technicians out there, but you know, did they have time for my phone call? Uh, were they willing to kind of pick up the reins if if I had an issue with the piano? And so, Floating Piano Factory is sort of built in, uh, like a built-in safety net, so people can explore and learn and learn rapidly and do a good job and feel comfortable and confident when they're going out there and tuning pianos, even when they're new to the business, um, and that's still running today. So anyways, uh, it was a number of years after starting Floating Piano Factory that I was researching in the piano industry at potential other opportunities to serve the industry. And so actually what I did was I spent a good amount of time making phone calls. So, you know, we have directories of piano technicians and I would call up piano technicians and we'd bond a little bit, we'd have some conversations, but really I'd ask them like, what, what do you need? Like where, what kind of problems are you having? And it, do you think there's any way that they could be solved, right? And of course, you know, I can tell you a few of the problems that came up in those conversations. And I had over a hundred conversations uh, with piano technicians all over the world during that process. Um, you know, of course, you know, we have services like Gazelle, right, that that help you keep track of your clients and help you do booking. That was certainly an issue that came up in those conversations. Um, another issue that came up in those conversations is just obtaining clients. Like, how do I market? How do people find out about me? You know, how do I have a website? You know, how do I, you know, get my get reviews about my business online and, and grow my business? That was another issue. Um, but the issue that really had some traction was a number of you out there said, hey, like, listen, I, I, I know what I'm doing, but at the same time, there's a lot of stuff that I don't know. And I feel uncomfortable when I'm going out there and doing work because um, I want to do the best possible job. But I sometimes wonder, how do I get the information? Um, and I talk to people who are, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, ostensibly in terms of of uh, networking with other piano technicians, you know, going to guild meetings and, you know, apprenticing with someone, right? So I talk to people who might have to travel four hours to go to a piano technician's guild meeting. And of course, and when they got there, they felt like they were the person who everybody else looked to for information, right? And say, oh, well, if I'm that guy for this or, or gal for that region, where do I look to for, for coaching and training? And uh, at the same time of hearing about that problem, uh, we heard uh, specifically, I had a very pivotal conversation uh, with Boaz Kirchenbaum. He, he, he was one of the people I interviewed. And, and unfortunately, it was like kind of one of the later people I interviewed. I just kind of wished he and I had this conversation earlier. Um, and he said he had two main problems. One was um, 
he did not like to see piano technicians out there doing work that was not quality, you know, not up to high standards, right? But he didn't blame the piano technicians for doing that lower quality work because he understood they might not have access to the education and the knowledge to do a good job. You know, you can't, you don't know what you don't know, right? Let's put it that way. And so he said that was one of his problems. But the other problem was he had training, he had knowledge, and he could deliver it to people, right? In in lecture format, you know, at, at like a guild meeting or he could travel to a convention, but it's a very limited audience that he could access, right? So those are like the two main problems, seeing work out there uh, that wasn't quite up to par and also being able to solve that problem by training people, but really not having the bandwidth to train as many people as he'd like, right? He, he could only do small groups. And uh, with those two problems in mind, we said, hey, what if we were able to do some online masterclasses? You know, we talked about it have to be good enough quality um, to kind of really, really get a, a good listen to things, a good, 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 view, good, good view of things, a close up view some like personalized potential attention and engagement. And so that's when we started setting up these one-off masterclasses and Boaz Kirschenbaum was the very first. Um, and it was just a test, right? I said, hey, Boaz, I'm gonna ask some people if they wanna attend it, we'll put a price point on it. And if, if we don't get enough people on board, we're not gonna do it, it's probably a bad idea. Um, so I think I had a threshold of about 30 people and sure enough, uh, we handily got 30 people to sign up for that first master class. It was a great success. We got great feedback. And then that was the sort of responsibility on my part. Hey, like I got to expand this. I got to extend this. Um, and that put me out there on the scene, you know, trying to see who else could get involved. And, uh, you know, even though I had been in the piano industry for a while, I wasn't as connected as I am today with sort of the best folks in the industry. So I was kind of cold calling folks like Del Fondrick, right? Or, or David Anderson, right? Or Rick Baldison or something like that and saying, hey, like I got this kind of fun idea. It seems like it might work. Are you interested in being involved? And you know, quite frankly, that was not easy. <laughs> there were some people who were like, yeah, I don't know. I've never done this before. Good luck or I'm too busy, stuff like that. But luckily, you know, we had some really, uh, really great supporters early on. Del Fondrick uh, was one of them, for example. David Anderson, of course, as you all know, was one of them really early on. Um, and we got a handful of folks that were really excited about it. And we started to do the master classes. Um, and then what I tried to do in order to support that project is create a sort of subscription service where annually you could sign up at the beginning of the year and say, hey, you know, trusting that there are going to be about six or seven lectures this year, um, sign me up and then I'll be able to attend all for one special price. So we got people signed on for that. Um, and of course, keep in mind, as I was doing this early on, there was support, but there was a lot of people who were like, didn't get it. Why would you even do this? You know, this doesn't make sense. Why, you know, why don't people just learn in person? And that was sort of my challenge to communicate to people, you know, what are the advantages here? Because there's certainly disadvantages, right? I can't sit next to my mentor, you know, they can't hold my hand and, you know, show me exactly the, the pressure that I put on the tuning hammer. Um, there's, there's a lot of disadvantages um, in terms of like being in the room with someone, having them watch you, you watching them. Those are all granted. But I think what people didn't realize is are the advantages. Okay, so one, you don't have to wait for that very special moment where you two can be in the same place, right? You could train with someone completely on the other side of the globe, like literally completely on the other side of the globe that you would never have access to. One really uh, counterintuitive thing was sometimes you, when you're doing remote learning, you can actually get a closer look at something that you couldn't see up close if you were um, in person. Right, because when we're in person and we're studying things, we can only really use our eyes to see. We don't use like microscopes or you know special cameras to like look into the action to see how it's doing. But when I have a camera up close, I can, I can get a close-up view of something from a distance, right? And you can really see what that what that looks like up close, what's going on in detail. And not only that, but everybody who's viewing can see that at the same time. 
right? So if you look at a convention format, everybody's sitting in chairs, they're all five, 10 to 15, 20, 25 feet away, only one or two people, if that, are really gonna get an up close and personal view of what's going on. And when we started doing things remotely, everybody could be happy, everybody could have a front, front row seat, everybody could get that, um, that specialized and up close and personal look at what's going on. So that all the, all those benefits started to be clear, you know, much appreciation. Some of you are here today from those folks that were like very early on supporters, uh, Larry Lobel, I see you there. I believe you were one of our earliest supporters, Calvin, I see you there. You think you were one of our earliest supporters. Like people were like, yeah, like this, this really makes sense to me. Um, and so we continued that. And then of course the pandemic hit. And this was a really good opportunity um, to really show what kind of value that we could provide. Um, and at the same time, it was a very difficult time. So that's, that's, that's when David Anderson and I, we had been close and he had been quite a vocal supporter of what I was doing. Um, but we started to become closer and, and collaborate a little bit more. And he was one of those people very early on when I said, hey, like we got to help the, you know, even though it's a tough time, even though we can sort of complain, even though we can look out for ourselves, um, only during this difficult time during the pandemic, hey, what if we did something to support the community? And that's when we started to go out there and do piano technicians master classes. And it was just an idea. It was just kind of fun. Um, David and An Anderson and I, you know, kind of powwowed on what it would be like. And it turned out to be this really awesome combination of his kind of like both uh, sort of young sensibility and his, you know, year of experience sensibility and sort of my intermediate uh, sort of even tempered sensibility. These two things came together and we created something that had uh, an appeal to, to a wider audience. Um, seemed to be very supportive of folks that were out there, um, sometimes with not a lot to do. And sort of we continued on with this. But the, the problem there was we could do this remote piano tech radio hour, but the way we were doing master classes at the time, I would actually go out, you know, plan a trip to visit the teacher that was going to teach. We'd get a camera crew together. We'd get, you know, AV support together. We'd get a live streaming crew together and we'd have to go on location to set things up and stream those lectures. And of course that started to be unfeasible, you know, during quarantine, you can't travel. Um, you don't want to go spreading diseases around the globe as you're traveling to set these things up you can get people in a close space so that's when we started to experiment with the convention format and um and that's been really cool and so for, for the time being um these conventions are probably going to be central to what we're doing we'll probably do a, ha a handful of them each year and uh and bear with us as we continue to experiment because this this domain is continuously changing and we want to bring you sort of the best formats that we can um, in order to give you quality content. Um, so at the moment, what we're doing is uh, we have these conventions. You can sort of get a seat at one of the conventions at various levels. Usually there's like attend one day, maybe you can attend all days, but only the live uh, format, or you can attend everything and access the recordings. And then in addition to that, if you're a subscriber, you can have access to the recordings like I said, on a monthly basis, they can just be released month after month and you can enjoy those like in a more digestible format as, as they come. And our plan right now is to um, notify people, like give you a little bit more detail and notice about, hey, what lecture is coming up this month, whether you're a subscriber or not a subscriber so that you can prepare for it. Oh, hey, like I gotta make time to watch this lecture. Um, with uh, with David Stanwood uh, this month, I really want to check it out. It's it's new, it's coming out. Check that out, and then the next month you can have a new lecture to focus on. Um, so so yeah, that's kind of where we're at uh, with everything, and uh, we'll be developing the the system more as as we find out how to serve you guys best. Um, but um, that's kind of the history <laughs> of what's going on. So. Beyond that, um, I don't know if anybody had any questions. I thought that was really good information to share because I'm realizing more and more not everybody knows kind of the, 
the full evolution of what's going on uh, with piano technicians uh, master classes. Um, so now that I went over that, um, again, if nobody has any questions or comments, no problem. Uh, I wanna go over, do like a review of our convention content uh, from this previous convention. Um, let you guys know if you haven't, um, you know, sort of been there for the convention, like how you can access the various lectures and so on and so forth, um, or get the convention content. Uh, and also just kind of tell you how things went and, you know, what was in each lecture, all that stuff for your, um, for the benefit of you having more information. So if you give me one second, I'll share my screen, make sure it's set up for sharing. There's that window. Okay, beautiful. All right, so I'll just take you back to the web page where we put the information for the convention and I'll go through the content, sort of like explain you know, what we went through and what kind of information uh, we discovered in each of these lectures. And by the way, um, I'll, maybe I'll have some time uh, to go into this a little bit before we wrap up, but um, I wanna go into the fact that we're actually gonna keep extending this convention. <laughs> We've discovered that, and this is what I'm talking about, having new new means of, of providing support to everyone. We're discovering, you know, a convention doesn't have to be three days in a row, right? A convention doesn't have to, um, it doesn't have to stop. Like it, once it's ended, just because people don't have to go home and leave their hotel rooms and do other things, we can add content, we can add days, we can do other things. We can add bonus content for people who are already a part of it um, as we continue. So that's something I'll go to a little bit later, but we plan to, if you have already signed up for this convention, we will be adding things for you um, as time goes on just for having um, subscribed for it. Um, and uh, yep. Yeah. So let me go through what we have here. So initially we planned days on the 2nd, the 10th and the 18th of September. We're now in October. We actually had ended up uh, doing a, uh, a day on the 25th. Um, this is a good moment. I can recognize the sponsors that we had involved. Um, so Randy Potter School, uh, very proud to have them be a sponsor of the project. Uh, very, uh, well-known name in the piano industry. And uh, Randy had never uh, actually been involved in our lectures. So it was a privilege to have Randy participate for the first time. Um, Benside Arts, that's Ken Ashutes. Uh He's been developing, you know, he had, has not only his own restoration and rebuilding shop that he um, brands as Benside Arts, but he also has education around that. So, um, He's been doing, experimenting himself with online learning, just like we have. And he's teaching people how to do belly work and all sorts of wonderful things in an online format. Um, so that's pretty awesome. And I'll put the, a link in the chat actually to the, the convention overview, because maybe you might find that useful to look at your own pace. Um, and then uh, Rayburn Piano Works. Um, Rayburn, I think we're all familiar with the Rayburn name. They're pretty big in the piano industry, at least on the technical side. Um, those folks who go out and tune pianos have heard of them. Um, they have Rayburn Cyber Tuner, uh, which is a sponsor, but also they sponsored through Rayburn Piano Works, which I think is a relatively new project of theirs. I believe they bought um, the business uh, from another piano technician in the industry. And they do you know, custom retrofit keyboards, and uh, are really upping their game in that particular domain and providing some excellent uh, keyboard work for folks. Um, Life in Tune is also a sponsor um, of the convention, which we'll be hearing about a little bit more as time goes on. Um, and this is a uh, this is Freddie Ravel, um, who is a very successful musician who's worked with everyone from Madonna to Al Jarreau um, to Earth, Wind and Fire. And he's played keyboards all over the world and piano all over the world with folks. And uh, right now he does kind of, uh, he, he does, uh, you know, keynote speaking, he does presentations and basically he takes music and brings it um, to people as a form of inspiration and, and helping them uh, do, you know, tune up their lives, right, um, through music. 
Um, so he, he's a really cool guy. He's a, he's a friend. He sponsored the convention. I want to thank him for that. And uh, we'll be ha we'll having some content from him on some of these future days that are coming up. Uh, Grand Work Tools. That's Chris Brown. Um, he he facilitates people doing regulation by creating these really awesome um, cus custom kits for setting up your action so you can do regulations at home to very high specifications. Uh, very smart guy, very smart engineer and manufacturer of tools. Um, and uh, so we appreciate him supporting us. Uh, Siegel Music Museum, also a sponsor, um, have this really cool music museum out in, I believe, South Carolina. And, you know, they have pianos there, they have historical pianos there, but they also have other really um, cool historical instruments from saxophones uh, to, I believe, like, I don't know, flutes, guitars, you know, you name it. Um, they have this really cool music museum where they're preserving musical history um, through the instruments that they have acquired. And then finally, Ravenscroft Pianos is also um, a really exciting new sponsor that we have. Um, Ravenscroft, of course, is run by... Um, uh, Michael Spreeman, who um, David Anderson, I know, would talk about very often as one of his inspirations in terms of, you know, doing quality action work and regulation and understanding, you know, how the piano works. David um, often said he learned probably the most from, um, from Michael Spreeman about how to work on pianos and piano actions. Um, and Ravenscroft is its own uh, brand of custom pianos. So uh, those are our sponsors. Let's uh, talk a little bit about um, some of the classes. Uh, first class, Rebuilding and Restoring the Upright Piano. This was a class with Bill Monroe. Um, a little bit of an overview on that. I gave a little bit of a sample as well, a video sample of the lecture a few weeks ago. Um, but just to kind of describe and explain what was part of that, um, Bill is kind of this guy who's just out there in the Midwest, you know, with his little shop, uh, uh, it's, it's little, but it's also big. You know, he created a custom building, which he also um, gave us a tour of, I think, on a radio hour previously, um, just for him to perform his uh, restoration work. He's got a very organized mind. Um, he, he, he plans, you know, down to the T things in advance. Um, and he has a r really, really, um, just a really, really specialized approach to restoring pianos. And on top of that, he, he also gave a lecture at a previous convention. Um, I believe it was the December 2020 convention where he just talked about kind of how does he sort of quote unquote sell jobs to his, um, his clients, right? And of course, like selling is, is a word that sometimes we can feel awkward with as piano technicians, but his approach is, is, is really interesting. He, he doesn't really quote unquote, sell anything very hard. He just makes a note um, with every client to give them an idea of what they could do um, to their piano if they wanted to, right? And it's always up to them to make that decision. Um, he creates a, a bid for them and says, you know, here it is. And he leaves it at that, you know, they can contact him if they're interested and they can just have it for information purposes. If, if not, um, and what was interesting for him, you know, he shared that during the pandemic, um, he actually had quite a bit of restoration work coming in and that's because he had these bids that he maybe put out sometimes, you know, two, three, four years ago and somebody came back around and said, Hey, like, I think it's time. I think I want to go ahead and do this. Um, so anyway, he does this kind of work, um, out of his home workshop that he custom built and he custom restores pianos. And so he took us through a, I think he said it was like a twenty-five to thirty thousand dollar job on an antique uh, AB Chase upright piano from 1914, and um, you know he said it's, it was a really good example of something that someone restored um, just out of full awareness, just as a family instrument. Um, they didn't expect, you know, that it, this was somehow um, supposed to have some sort of resale value you know they just wanted this piano to be in great condition they wanted to enjoy it and that expense was worth it for them um, just to, to have the instrument for themselves to enjoy it in their home and have it restored and uh, in this case you know there, I don't think there could have been a better person to perform this restoration 
um, than Bill. Uh, he gave us a, a very in-depth pre presentation packed with information about nearly every step in the process from you know, replacing the casters uh, to uh, refinishing the exterior to you know polishing the screws and, and finishes and you know even going so far as to you know remove the all the parts of the pedal assembly and you know work on the interior restore the interior of the piano something that the that the client might not even really see that much but make that look new and fresh and uh, and uh, you know aesthetically pleasing. Um, so basically, he took this piano that if you saw it, you'd say, hey, it kind of looks like an old bar piano um, that, uh, you know, who knows whether it's worth much and really turned it into a work of art, in my opinion. Um, clearly, Bill takes a lot of pride in his work. And um, on top of that, he took pride in his presentation. So he, you know, took it very seriously, gave a wonderful presentation, lots of photos. Um, and I think, as I said before, information packed, right? <laughs> he was just, you know, going and going and going because we had he had one hour and um, he covered pretty much the whole process in in fine detail. Um, but on that note, uh, he didn't cover his hammer hanging process. <laughs> so uh, after that, um, uh, Chris Brown came in and and picked that up. That was one thing that's kind of funny. Bill said during the presentation, "Hey, well, here's the hammer hanging. Well, I won't be able to go into as much detail in that." We said, "All right, that's okay." Um, our next lecture is with Chris Brown. Uh, and of course, uh, Chris Brown went really deep into that process um, himself, uh, and he used his his tools, um, as mentioned earlier, um, to demonstrate, like you know, how he can really create a customized hammer hanging job that you know fixes issues that you might find in a piano action. Um, he talked about some of the alignment issues that may not be obvious to the novice who's um, hanging hammers. And uh, you know, talked about how he solved those issues and approaches that he took to hanging the hammers. And what was cool about that lecture is he brought in some custom video that he had filmed prior to the lecture, um, so that again, you know, this is one of the advantages of this type of of online content. You know, he got up close and personal with the actual. Um, you know, piano action and, and hammers that he's working on. So he could really see what he was doing. And then uh, um, on top of that, right, people with the recording can go back and review it um, and uh, get a deeper dive into what's going on. That's another advantage uh, I didn't mention of, of these uh, online classes to the in-person events is, you know, we often have a recording, right, where you can go back and you can review it. And walking away from a convention with a notepad full of notes, um, doesn't always quite cut it in terms of trying to remember what you learned and apply it. So uh, on to the next lecture of the convention, tuning tips, tricks, and tools. This was Randy Potter. Um, I'll, I'll say we tend to focus on some of the more advanced techniques and, uh, and issues that piano technicians were want, gonna wanna deal with in our master classes. This particular class I think was kind of cool in that it was a little bit different than we, what we typically do. Um, a little bit more geared towards general exposure to what you need to know as a piano technician. Maybe some key things that, you know, you might not learn for five years uh, after getting started, but are kind of simple things um, that you learn along the way as a piano technician. You know, hey, what are all the different piano tuning hammers out there and why would I use this one over that one? Hey, how do I, you know, efficiently use my mutes uh, when I'm tuning how do I make sure that I'm using uh, a strip mute properly? And what are the different techniques and ways of doing that? Um, and, you know, here's some, you know, interesting tools that you might not have heard about, um, but you'd only hear about after being involved for several years. Uh, so I, I, I recommend that lecture for somebody who's a beginner um, or intermediate, and they just kind of want to pick up some interesting information. Um, powerful information that could really up your games, really simple, um, but you might not have known about. And then we had a lecture with CyberTuner. Carl Lieberman was kind of the, the lead instructor, but then Dean Rayburn was uh, also instructor on that particular lecture. And they gave us information on kind of the most up-to-date things that are going on with CyberTuner. Very interesting to hear some. I use CyberTuner, but it was interesting to hear some of the things that I wasn't quite aware of that they talked about 
you know, talked about different ways that the pitch raise um, mode gets used, how to use that more efficiently to make your piano tuning quicker. Um, they have this thing that they call AI mode, um, which uh, <laughs> I thought I thought it stood for artificial intelligence. It may just stand for oral um, oral something or other. Um, but uh, but either way, it's kind of an interesting. Uh, nuanced version of what they've already been doing. So, so typically with the way that they calculate a piano tuning, there's sort of a certain template, like a certain mathematical template that gets used to calculate that. But then when they use this AI mode, it, it kind of takes more into account the nuances of a piano. And, you know, they, they show graphically, you know, and mathematically in that presentation, how some notes um, on a piano could be wildly different if you use this AI mode, which incorporates, you know, oral nuances that you might get when you do an oral tuning and, uh, and some, also some mathematical techniques that are pretty cool. So they showed how just like maybe a few notes, right, uh, near the bridge could be, you know, wildly off from what you might mathematically predict if you used a simple method, but using the AI mode, you could, um, you know, adjust for some irregularities in the piano and make the piano sound quite a bit better. And it's just a few things that they talked about in that lecture. Um, that was really cool. Um, Sally Phillips talked about new and rebuilt piano preparation. Um, Sally is uh, pretty much one of the best minds in the piano industry. She's really incredible at uh, piano restoration. Um, she's a Steinway expert. She's been dealing with Steinway pianos for many, many years. Um, and so, uh, you know, she just took us through basically like those things that if you're not paying attention um, can be issues that you need to deal with with new and rebuilt pianos um, as they go out to the client, right? Um, there's going to be parts that are going to settle in. You know, how are you going to account for that? Um, how are you going to make sure that when the piano gets delivered, the client's going to get a quality experience of that piano. Because as we all know, with you know pianos, just like with you know shoes or something, right? There's just like a break-in period. There's things that you got to pay attention to um, that are kind of more important in the early stages of of owning that instrument. And uh, she did a really great job, as always, of presenting things. And as always, she has a lot of unique ideas that you're not going to hear. Um, you know, just through word of mouth within the piano industry. Um, very kind of acute, uh, specialized techniques and ideas um, that may be counterintuitive or may not actually seem that important if, if you uh, didn't already think about them. But if you pay attention to stuff like this, uh, my, my belief is that uh, that puts you on a, a lot higher level as a piano technician and, you know, allows you to you know, have a great reputation, you know, charge more, get work on better types of pianos. So um, that was a really excellent lecture with Sally Phillips. Um, piano appraisals for piano techs. Uh, that was an enlightening lecture with Leo Holder. Um, Leo is a piano appraiser. He had a piano store. You know, he basically did everything in the piano industry in the New York City area, primarily over a, probably the course of several decades. And um, he, he kind of said to us, he's basically in like a retirement stage for the last several years. And because he always, uh, he came from Russia um, and his English wasn't that great, uh, he never got to pursue the career of uh, potentially a lawyer <laughs> that he always aspired to. So his, um, his uh, placeholder for that was, hey, uh, the appraisal business actually, when you get deep into it, does require uh, quite a complicated understanding of the law. You know, you get into insurance issues, um, you get into, you know, potential legal issues with that. Um, so he studied, he's done all the kind of examinations and training necessary to be um, considered an appraiser um, that can give, uh, that can give, you know, appraisals for market valuation insurance, estate and charitable donations and really do that um, uh, in the most appropriate way, in a, in a legally, uh, in a, a legally appropriate way, things like that. So that lecture was really, really educational. I know a lot of us struggle with how we can approach 
uh, appraisals or sort of estimations of the value of the piano. In general, one tip I took away is you, you might not want to call what you do an appraisal if you're not trained as an appraiser, you know, um, and you might, you definitely don't want to claim that, you know, you have some sort of uh, credential uh, where you can, you know, give these sort of sentiments for insurance purposes or things like that. I think the best you can do if you're not an, appra an official appraiser is, uh, you know, just give your opinion and say that's what it is. And, you know, you can do that. And uh, you can probably do that within a certain range of piano prices and types, you know, that are, you know, within the several hundred to seven, several thousand dollar range. Um, but, you know, another takeaway from that presentation is, you know, if you want to uh, complete appraisals that are at a higher level for specific situations, you know, donations, um, insurance, things like that, then you can partner with someone who is uh, trained in appraisals and you know you can even charge a charge a, a premium on top of what they charge you for the for serving the um, the client that you bring to the table and uh, you know everybody wins right like uh, you you can provide a service for your clients that they appreciate um, you can uh, make a little bit of money for having the appropriate connections and and pointing them to the appropriate resources and the appraiser can you know do the job that they're trained to do and do it well uh, so that's very interesting lecture next one uh, let's see here let's see there may be a chat oral intervals yeah that's right Donna um, you mentioned that a couple of minutes ago yeah that's what AI stands for I think oral intervals um, so that goes back to the cyber tuner lecture and, you know, kind of like, what did that mode do? It kind of pretended that you're listening with your ear and you're checking intervals and comparing these particular notes and strings. How would that potentially be a little bit different than a generalized calculation that, um, that cyber tuner might perform? So uh, next lecture, and boy, we had a lot of content. I'm really proud that we kind of be we're able to bring all of this together so far like i said we're going to bring some more things to the table too so i'm excited to be able to, be able to deliver all that to folks um four important early american made pianos instructor tom strange he is the proprietor at the siegel music museum which we mentioned earlier and man is he like a, a history buff so um, he not only talked about kind of some of the specifics of the the functionality of these pianos, um, but he also, you know, talked about how their places in history. And there's actually even a piano that came across his path that's now within his museum, um, where where there just so happened to be a family connection. It was like some, you know, someone on along the line of his family tree was related to the person who once owned the piano that ended up in his museum. Um, so very cool, some interesting stories. And we'll probably get Tom to participate some more, maybe even in another session um, that will be included with the convention content, just talking a little bit more about just piano history in general, because I'm finding out he is, uh, you know, just a wealth of information. He's his own encyclopedia of piano history, which there are not many of us um, that have that kind of knowledge. So we'd love to access him for that. Um, so he, he said the technology and stories between the John Barrent piano of 1775, Alpheus Babcock first iron frame piano of 1825, Robert and William Nunn's unicord piano of 1834, and the Chickering cocked hat grand piano of 1855. The ways that these pianos changed the landscape for piano making and marketing and the technology hurdles that were overcome create a fascinating background to the modern piano today. Um, so yeah, if you want something that's, uh, you know, both historical and, and Tom's of course an engineer. So he has some, you know, he thinks like an engineer, he presents things in a really clear and, and, uh, and packaged way. So that was a fun lecture there. And then, uh, Ken Eschete actually came on and, uh, he brought on, um, Ken Walkup as well. Um, who is uh, at Cornell University's historic keyboard collection. Although I think Ken is sort of in the process of retiring, he's still involved in this historic keyboard collection. Um, the two Kens had collaborated on the restoration of this antique play -El piano. And uh, they took us through that process, talked about some of the hurdles that they encountered. You know, Ken had some, uh, some models for illustration to kind of show us, you know, 
technically what was going on with some of the problems with these pianos and how he addressed them. And uh, that was a, a really thorough and interesting project. And, you know, as with, uh, say, the theme of wool in the 2019 or the 2020 December convention that we had, um, this convention had its own little themes, right? We talked a little bit about, we talked quite a bit about rebuilding. Um, you know, we had a, a lecture that went from, uh, you know, rebuilding an upright and then transition to a nice lecture on ha hammer hanging to complement that. Uh, we also developed some themes around, you know, historical pianos here and like appraisals and sort of the different, um, the different niches within the piano industry where you can find value or have specialized knowledge. Uh, and so we found out that, you know, e even uh, the, the piano, the piano appraiser, for example, has their specialties. They might not even be a specialty in historical instrument appraisals, and they might want to connect with someone who is, right? Um, and people who know about historical instruments might not also have the skill to appraise them, right? They might want to connect with a, uh, a specialized appraiser. Um, so but that was interesting, talking about piano history, the value of instruments, the value of restoring them. How do you maintain the value if you come across an old piano um, that you think has some value? How do you address it? You know, are there things you should restore and change? Or are there things you should actually leave the same, even though they're not at performance level and might be appropriate not to restore them um, for the purposes of historical preservation. So we learned a lot about the details of how to approach those things uh, within this convention. Um, Alan Etter gave a lecture on the uncommon, the unusual, and the unique. Uh, very interesting sort of uh, smorgasbord of information, um, just sort of some tools, uh, some, some specialized techniques that you might not have heard of. Alan works at a university in California. Um, and so he brought in a lot of interesting things that he had encountered working on university pianos and how he dealt with some of the problems and, and issues that he encountered on a daily basis, um, working with those pianos and also managing a team of, of student technicians that he trains and, um, and manages when they are working on pianos. Uh, Wayne Ferguson, actually this lecture topic uh, changed a little bit. Wayne Ferguson talked a bit about uh, uh, piano preparation. Um, he went through a process that he basically learned, uh, I believe through Yamaha, but modified, you know, he has a very um, interesting, um, uh, thorough way to address the piano regulation process. Uh, and it's, it's outlined in a, in a one sheet that's very succinct, but very informative in managing that process. Uh, we had a couple of glitches with uh, Wayne's uh, lecture and we'll probably be recording an, an updated version um, to, uh, to accompany what we already have. Um, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, grand Piano Construction is the, the final lecture that we had here um, uh, that was again added as bonus content. And if you're just a Radio Hour subscriber or attendee, then you may have gotten a little bit of an insight into that. Um, so that, uh, that occurred just last Saturday. And Radio Hour subscribers were not only able to see the fourth hour of that lecture, because it was over four hours long, but we let you kind of accompany us into the fifth hour, because uh, uh, Michael Spreeman and Leo, as uh, Joachim Leonardi likes to be referred to um, in common parlance, had a ton of really interesting stuff to say about construction of pianos. And, you know, we planned three to four hours and ended up being, you know, over four hours, almost five hours of content. Um, that I would say is a super valuable lecture just because we don't have a lot of information um, on how people think about piano design and construction. Um, if you want to learn about that, you either have to kind of just figure it out yourself by taking pianos apart and putting them back together. Um, maybe you have to be a part of a, a factory, right? And, and be really inside on the process of that design yourself. Uh, but pretty much there's, there's really not a lot of ways to access that. And um, from what I've heard, although it might be, ch it's probably changing in the past several years, um, some of these piano manufacturers don't necessarily even have a lot of design skill in house. Right. They're just kind of using uh, design uh, that has been 
stood the test of time. So, oh, okay, this is how the pianos have been made. Let's continue to make them that way. They don't always have experts on staff that are focused on piano design. In fact, they might actually ship in people like Michael Spreeman or, or Leo to kind of help them design pianos. So having a four or five hour lecture just to focus on piano design, uh, concepts and issues um, is really a treasure for us to be able to access. Um, so they talked about that content for uh, four hours. They talked about plate design. They talked about scaling. They talked about you know the frame of the piano. They talked about soundboard. They talked about um, uh, bridges. And uh, they brought in a lot of thoughtful information. They compared different piano designs. They talked about you know what I thought was really fascinating is Leo has this sensibility where he can see. A piano right he can look at the plate of the piano and the shape of the piano and he could tell you how it's going to sound which is fascinating so someone who spent that much time designing pianos that they can tell us things about the tone of the piano just by looking at it um, and it makes sense of course but it's, it's not obvious that you would be able to do that so um, so that's that and then I'll, I'll give you a little bit more about what's upcoming um, I do have some lectures that are going to come up from um, Freddie Ravel is going to give a, a special introduction um, to some of our other content that's going to be coming in the future here. Um, he's, he's the musician, I said, played with Madonna, Earth, Wind and Fire, Al Jarreau, many more. Um, we have a, a lecture with, um, uh, who am I thinking of? He's a, he's a, he's a, uh, a flamenco jazz piano player. Um, who takes the rhythms of his native country, Spain, and incorporates them into jazz music. He's going to teach us a bit about, you know, how to go about doing that and, um, and uh, you know, how he's thought about that and how his thoughts about music have, have evolved. And I, I literally, um, I've been able to meet with him and, and, uh, and pre-recorded some content from him. And I've been experimenting with the stuff just at home in my own playing, and it's been really cool. Um, being inspired by, by what he brought to the table. His name is Chano Dominguez. Um, he's a friend of mine uh, from New York City who's a Grammy award-winning piano player who's played all over the world, you know, Carnegie Hall um, to probably Blue Note Jazz, uh, jazz uh, Club in, in New York City. Um, and then uh, on top of that, we have Frederick Chu who's been lecturing with us previously. And he talks about pedal techniques. He has very advanced ways of talking about pedal techniques. He's probably one of the only pianists in the world, just among a handful, who really, who really thinks in a very uh, thoughtful way about how he uses pedals. He talks about um, the sustain pedal and some of the nuances that many people don't think about. Um, he talks about the Sassanudo pedal and some of the nuances that many people don't think about. And he talks about um, the shift pedal and again, the theme of what he talks about is nuances that people don't typically think about and how he incorporates them in his playing and his interpretation of various um, you know, pieces, historical music pieces, how he puts a spin on them by doing special things with the pedal. Uh, example, you know, he, he might play uh, Deb Debussy's Claire de Lune. He gives an example of how he plays that, but he used his specialized pedal techniques that probably no one else would ever think to use um, to create a really cool interpretation uh, of that kind of music. So um, I hope that was useful, folks. Um, just a little bit of an overview, not only of the history of Piano Technician's master classes, but um, of the convention uh, as it stands today and some of the things that are, are to come for the people who have uh, signed up for that content. And uh, and uh, next week, we'll, we'll see you again and looking to uh, bring bring uh, some more guests on in the future. So uh, look out for some some cool content. I'm talking to, I guess, you know, I'll say this out loud because um, I think we're probably going to get there. I'm talking to like um, uh, Fazioli Pianos to maybe come in and bring us some content. Um, we did have a special interview. Oh, it's not even listed on the website. I have to put that up there. We had a special interview um, with someone from Stein. Uh, what is it? Uh, Steinway. Uh, ah, I can't think of it. <laughs> we had a, we had another special interview as part of the 
as part of the convention uh, with a piano manufacturer in Germany that for whatever reason, I can't think of the name of right now, um, but a very, uh, Grotrian, there you go. So we had the CEO of Grotrian. Uh, we have a special interview that's included in that content for the convention. I did an interview with him and he would like to participate further in the future. You know, maybe we can bring on some content where technicians from his, um, from his factory floor come in and, and show us some interesting stuff. So, um, yeah, so we're looking forward to see you again next week. Thank you guys all for joining today. Um, it's been a pleasure as always. Uh, feel, feel to reach out to me if you have comments, questions, or, or anything else you'd like to chat about. This is all for you. So, you know, I'm always open to your feedback and, and things. All right. Um, yeah, Elday, thanks for being here. John Ross, thank you for, for attending. Cl Kevin Clem, always great to see you here as well. Uh, we'll sign off for now and uh, see you next week. Thank you so much for giving us an hour of your time. Remember that you can catch us live online every Saturday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. That's right. Go to pianotechradio.com to register so you can interact live and ask questions of our guests. See you next week.